Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, if you would, please. They've tried to improve, and they put a little bit of carpet on the platform. We have enough money to carpet our entire platform at our church. <laughs> but I'll get used to it. And by the time I do, they'll change it. Probably put a skating rink there or something like that. I always have exciting things happen when I travel. I was preaching this morning at the Faith Baptist Church in Canoga Park for my good friend, Brother Tim Rasmussen, and they have a beautiful guest house. I mean, quartz countertops, big stainless steel washer and dryer, lovely, lovely place. And I have a little issue with my right foot. It always gets dry and cracked. So I put this stuff called a heel stick on the bottom of it. Every time I take a shower, put some on, put my socks on. And I didn't want to put my foot up on his nice furniture, get grease on the bed or the chair or something. So I put my foot up on the toilet. Seat was down. That's unusual for a man. You ladies should learn how to operate the toilet seat, then you wouldn't be so upset with us. You need it down, we need it up, all right? So. And so I put the heel stick on the bottom of my foot, started to put my sock on, and my foot went right through the seat into the toilet. <laughs> Broke the seat in three pieces. <laughs> you don't believe me? I have a picture on my phone. I'll show you later. <laughs> Always have a lot of fun when I travel. I told you the story a few years back. I was preaching at Canoga Park, and Brother Asmussen had put some goodies in my room there, including a large Hershey's chocolate bar. I had eaten part of it and decided I'd save the rest, wrapped it back up in the wrapper, wrapper, put it in my bag. I'm from Michigan. It doesn't get 110 degrees in Michigan. By the time I got to the room here, I discovered the Hershey bar had melted all over my underwear. <laughs> which meant I could not get in an accident. So, I said, uh, somebody said, what are you doing after church tonight, Brother Willette? I said, laundry. <laughs> and I went to the room and I was doing my laundry. Somebody came by and they saw me doing the laundry. They said, oh, you told the truth. Like that was a surprise. I, I don't know where you go to church, but we try to tell the truth at our churches. One of our kind of picky little rules. Hebrews chapter 11, stand with me if you don't mind as we look at the seventh verse of Hebrews 11. I appreciate the service. I appreciate the great privilege of being here. It's so great an honor for me to be a friend of Brother Chapel, and I love what's going on here. Both of our daughters graduated from West Coast Baptist College. Both of them found their husbands here, serving in the Lord's work with them together now, and they're just really thrilled. Half of our graduating class from Bridgeport Baptist Academy is coming this fall to West Coast Baptist College, and we're excited about that, and just thrilled with what happens to the young people that are here. And this, I've said so many times, is an example church for this generation of Christians, a model. And I appreciate you folks who are members of this church, holding up the hands of your pastor, knocking on doors, winning people to Christ, doing what needs to be done to reach this area, but encouraging people all around the country and all around the world that it can still be done. And thank you so very, very, very much. Now the Bible says in the book of Genesis, yeah, I know I told you Hebrews, you stay there. That God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it grieved and repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them, but... The earth was not destroyed. The animals were not all eliminated. Because the Bible says one man and his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The best definition I know of grace is a divine influence on the heart and its effect in the life. It seems to fit every time I find the word grace mentioned in the Bible. 
Tonight, as we say, grace is divine enablement. I certainly believe that. But the chapel often says grace is a disposition created by the Holy Spirit. I believe that. But God works on our heart and enables our lives to produce the fruit that would be impossible without his help. Noah. Just Noah. Noah and his wife and the three sons that would be born 30 years after Noah started building the ark found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We read this about Noah in Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Father, thank you for your goodness and your love to us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here these days. And Lord, would you do a great work in the hearts of all those who attend the conference and help us to be inspired and encouraged and convicted and corrected. Help us, Lord, to see what you have done here and then to get a vision of what you want us to do in our respective areas of service. Bind the devil, I pray, and his demons as I preach. Don't let them snatch from our hearts the good seed of your word. And help me to say, only the things, but all the things that you want said. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name for all that's done. Bless the preaching. Bless the invitation. Amen. You may be seated. In 1926, H.L. Mencken, called the Sage of Baltimore, a satirical, cynical, ungodly man, he said, uh, heave an egg out of a Pullman. He meant a train car. And you'll hit a fundamentalist almost anywhere in the United States. 1926. Bob Jones University founded in 1927. Billy Sunday was still preaching. My dad later met and had a luncheon with Ma Sunday. I came of age, graduated from college in 1973. In 1974, Elmer Towns published a list of the 100 largest Sunday schools in America. I bet you three quarters or more of them were independent, fundamental Baptist churches. Largest on the list was First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. Seventh on the list was the Indianapolis Baptist Temple, also in Indiana. Lee Robertson in Tennessee and Harold Henniger in Canton, Ohio and Trinity Baptist in Florida and Beth Haven Baptist in Kentucky and the Emanuel Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan. High Street Baptist in Missouri, 22nd on the list was Northside Baptist in Charlotte, North Carolina, 39th was the Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina, largest church in Georgia was the Forest Hills Baptist Church, Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral was number 26 on the list, and a whole bunch of independent fundamental Baptists were way ahead of him. Colorado, the South Sheridan Baptist Church, largest church in that state. South Carolina, Tabernacle Baptist Church, pastored by Harold Seitler. And I remember coming out of college then, and it was cool to be us. It really was. I mean, we, we were the ones getting it done. A, a Southern Baptist said to a man one time who was an independent, isn't it a little hard for you to be outside of the mainstream of Baptist life? And he just started saying what I just said, largest church in the state of Indiana, independent Baptist church, largest church of any kind in the state of Tennessee. We went down the list and he said to the Southern Baptist man, how do you feel being out of the mainstream of Baptist life? And we were kind of strutting our stuff. And we were pretty proud of our progress and impressed with our numbers, but we weren't right because we were big. To the extent that we were right in those days, we were right because we were consistent with the Word of God. The song the Bartlett so beautifully sang said it, the preacher said it. It's a different era now. And I'd like to suggest as we face the future that we need some more Noah's. Few of God's great servants have been in the majority. Joseph was sold into slavery. Moses Moses attacked frequently by his own followers and at least on one occasion by Miriam, a part of his own family. 
Paul was persecuted in far more places than he was ever promoted. Ezekiel was scorned and ignored. And then later on, he got to be their popular entertainment. And they listened to him, but they wouldn't do a thing he said. And he said, I'm as one who plays a very lovely song and you have not danced. Jeremiah was branded a traitor. And Noah and his family were the only righteous people in the entire world. It's usually not that bad. Elijah thought it was that bad. He said, you know, the people have torn down the, your altars and, and they have slain your prophets and they, they have turned away from you. And I and I only remain alive. And God said, no, 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 don't feel like the Lone Ranger. There's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, but not in Noah's day. I don't know if this is true. I'm not sure anybody does, but people believe that there may have been in the billions of people on the earth in the days of Noah. They figured that by figuring how long people lived and how long of those years they had children. And Noah was the only one. Now, I'm not suggesting that because things are bad out there, you're just going to have to hunker down, hide in your fortified foxholes, put up the drawbridge, build a big moat filled with piranhas, and just hang on until the rapture comes back. You'll find no prophets of doom speaking at this conference. You'll find no one who thinks you can't get it done. The preacher preached a message to the college young people recently, and I listened to it on CD, and he said, we may be living in a layout of sea and age, but you can still build a Philadelphian church. I like that. No, you can win people to Christ. The gospel is amazing, powerful. I've recently come again under the realization of the wonderful, transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe in the gospel. Amen. Lee Robertson said if people aren't being saved, it's either because the gospel has lost its power or because the gospel is not being given. Now, I believe you can build great churches and win thousands of people to Christ and start Christian schools and train young people and disciple converts, but I do want you to understand we will not get much encouragement or approval or respect or even tolerance from most of the world. We are in a distinct minority believing that marriage should be between a man and a woman. We're in a distinct minority believing that the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant, perfect, and preserved Word of God. It is offensive to modern, tolerant, uh, liberal, uh, uh, educated, cultured people that we believe there's only one way to heaven, and His name is Jesus. So let's look at Noah for a little bit. The imagination of the thoughts of man's hearts was only evil continually. It repented the Lord God that he had made man, and it grieved him at his soul, and he said, I'll destroy man whom I made from off the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why did he do what he did? Notice, if you will, first of all, his motivation by faith. Faith is simply believing God when He says something. Amen. Faith is not the absence of doubt. I, I have a hunch there many times during that building project Noah had that he thought, I wonder if it's ever really going to rain. Man, it's been a long time. I wonder if I'll ever get this done. The, the, the environmentalists are after me for cutting down so many trees. The neighbors are tired of my saws making noise in the middle of the night. My kids are sick and tired of me uh, being so busy I can't play with them. My wife has had it with all the sawdust being tracked into the house. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is trusting God a little more than you listen to your doubt. Three Hebrew children, Pastor Chapel mentioned, I love the verse that says, Nebuchadnezzar, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace which thou hast prepared, and he will deliver us. Amen. I like it. Go for it, guys. Except the next three words out of their mouths were, but if not, <laughs> he will. You sure? Yes. Mostly. Sort of. I think so. It's okay to doubt, just don't act on your doubts. 
Just believe God. Uh, did the Bible say that God's word never would return void? Did the Bible say that Jesus would never leave us or forsake us? Did the Bible say that if you trained up a child in the way he should go and his old, he would not depart from it? Did the Bible say that God would supply your needs if you even had to go to a Christian college and maybe didn't have enough money when you started out there? Did the Bible say that if you come out from among them and be separate, that God will receive you and be a father to you and you'll be a sons and daughters? You know, all you have to know is if the Bible says it, it's so. And if you act on it, it'll be okay. Faith. But there was another motivation. By faith, Noah moved of God. But by faith, Noah, the Bible says, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Now, people say, well, he had a fear of God. I suspect he did. But that's not what it's talking about here. Listen to what it says. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. What's that talking about? The flood. You know how he built the ark? He didn't want to drown. <laughs> That's what the ark was all about. I'm going to send rain on the earth and there's going to be a great flood and, and if you don't build this ark, you and your family and the animals I'd wish to preserve will all perish. Uh, now, now I, I just want to tell you as you look at how bad the world is getting and I, I'm a little bit sick of watching the news. Yeah, yeah. I think it's about a good idea we just take a vacation from the news. I get sick watching the tigers too but for a different reason. <laughs> And it's a mess out there. And, and they want girls to have boys come into their locker room. And we who think it's wrong are somehow weird and twisted and narrow and, and paranoid and all kinds of other nonsense. And all the crazy things that are going on. And you say, what's well, terrible? I don't know if America can survive. I heard somebody say years ago, if God does not judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, shut up. First of all, God never has to apologize to anybody for anything. Second of all, you let God decide what he wants to do. <laughs> you don't get to tell God what he's going to do. He'll tell you what he's going to do. Is judgment coming? Well, sooner or later, yeah, I know it's going to all burn up eventually. But if you think it's really bad, and if you think things are really terrible, and if you think the nation is going to the devil, then somebody better build an ark. Somebody better make a refuge. Somebody ought to offer an alternative. Somebody ought to tell people there's a way out of all this mess. Somebody ought to tell some people about Jesus. Somebody ought to knock on some doors. Somebody ought to win some souls. Somebody ought to disciple some converts. You say, the world's really bad. That doesn't mean you ought to hunker down and hide. It means you ought to get out on the street and go to work and tell somebody about Jesus. My wife was in a little town near us called Frankenmuth. Took her mother there. My mother-in-law lives with us. She's 91. She doesn't have too many good days anymore. And they were able to spend a couple of hours there in that pretty little town. And she saw an older man. He had a jacket on, indicated he'd served in the armed services, was a veteran. And she went up and introduced herself and thanked him for his service. And he told her he'd been in the Korean War and was a prisoner of war, he said, for three years, one month, and one day. He was a machine gun operator. Ran out of ammunition. He told me the story. I, she got his address and went by to see him. Eighty six years old. Said they fed us millet, which is bird seed. Said when the Chinese came, it got a little better. They gave us a little ball of rice every day. He said that he was in what they called the 100 mile march. He said, We lost a man every mile on that march. I thought maybe I could allow him, get him to allow us to tell his story in our patriotic service coming up at the end of this month. He wasn't real interested in that. He was fine to talk to me, but he didn't want much attention being brought to himself. But he did listen to the gospel. And he did pray and ask the Lord Jesus to be his Savior. And, and he did get saved. And, and you know, I, I hear people say, well, it's hard to lead people to Christ these days. Just mark it down. People who say that, they're not talking to too many people. His motivation, notice his preparation. 
It was an unreasonable task. It was unreasonable because of the nature of the task. He's going to build a boat 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, 45, 75 feet high, 45 feet wide. You know, naval experts said that's the most stable design that has ever been for a ship. It was the largest seagoing vessel ever built until the late 1800s. No boat was built as big as the ark until the late 1800s. Huge task. Unbelievable because of the nature of the task. 100,000 square feet, a million and a half cubic feet. There was no lumberyard. He didn't run down to Lowe's and put it in order and try to have it drop shipped out in front of his house. He had no power tools. He had no help. His sons weren't even born until he'd been on the project. I mentioned earlier for 30 years, and it was an unreasonable task because of the necessity of the task. God said it's going to rain and there'll be a big flood. Well, two problems. There'd never been a flood and it never rained. A mist covered the ground, the Bible said. It was an unsubsidized task. It's what they call today in politics an unfunded mandate. Just go cut down some trees and make some boards and build you an ark. You know, I've known people can't serve God because they didn't have enough money. Graduate from college with a young man that was sharp. I mean, while we were scrounging around to preach at a jail or a rescue mission, he was doing revival meetings. The guy was sharp. He married the daughter of a pastor, a friend of my dad's, a beautiful young lady, talented, that played the piano, sang, and he was going to be an evangelist. And so when he graduated, he went to work for the Ford Motor Company because he had to take care of his family, which was him and his wife. You wouldn't want to trust God to do that. You better trust the Ford Motor Company. Preached a few meetings. Made some money. Had an idea. Made some money on that. Started a travel company. Made some money on that. Gross, I think, $4 million in the first year. And by the second year, the FBI was looking for him to indict him for fraud. I just can't serve God. I don't have enough money. You, you know what? Maybe, maybe sometimes God doesn't give you all the money right ahead of time. Maybe there ought to be somebody that doesn't wait until they get enough support to come to Lancaster, California. Maybe somebody ought to come, pay their own moving expenses, have no salary, uh, not have enough money to go out with a family after church, have to scrounge around in the back seat of a car to find some change. And maybe somebody ought to just say, well, God said to do it, so I'll do it, and he can pay for it later on. An unpopular task. You know how many converts Noah had? After 120 years? Well, if you count him, one, but he already found grace in the eyes of the Lord. If you count his wife, too, but she was probably in line with him. If you count his boys, then there'd be five. And, and I guess maybe you could count their wives. Maybe the three people they married decided to believe like them. So maybe you can say after 120 years, Noah had three converts. The rest of the world didn't believe him. I, I don't know this for sure. I kind of think in Noah's day they probably didn't tell Polish jokes. In Maine and New England they tell French jokes. I think probably they told Noah jokes. I think Saturday night after the boys had had a few beers, they went down by Noah's house and said, Hey, Noah, what you building? Yeah, an ark. <laughs> yeah, what's an ark? Okay, that's going to float in water right, Noah. Come on, we're halfway between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and there's never been a boat that big ever built. We've never seen enough water to hold a boat like that. Oh, oh, that's right. It's going to, what's that you call it? R yeah, rain, rain. Yeah. <laughs> Water's going to come out of the sky. <laughs> Didn't convince anybody. Didn't convert anybody. But you know what he did? He kept building. Would you mark this down? Popularity does not equal spirituality. Amen. Oh, there's a new way of doing it. You see, the old ways don't work anymore, and you've got to try some new stuff. You, you better have music like they like in the world and like appeals to their flesh, and you better dress the way that they would dress if they went to a ball game or maybe to change the oil on their car. 
And you need to use really cool language, maybe even cuss every once in a while. Be real careful. Don't say anything about, I'm going to be careful, I'm coming up to this carpet again. <laughs> don't say anything about their worldly behavior and, and don't act like anything that they do is wrong at all. And then maybe you can get you a church because, you know, this generation, they don't like all that negativity and they don't like to be confronted and they don't like to think that there's only one way to heaven and they don't like to have you feel like you're standing up and being authoritative and telling them what to do. Did you know something? Bill Hybels wrote a book. I've got a copy of it. It's called Reveal. Where are we going? And in the book, he bemoans the fact that the people at his Willow Creek Church are less less biblical than the world as a whole. They have more divorces than the world as a whole. They don't give much money. They don't have a biblical worldview. And he said, you know, this is amazing. I read this in his book. Uh, it's sitting on the shelf in my library right now. He said, we found out as we did this survey they spent $70,000, employed a guy who used to work for Procter & Gamble to do a survey, and here's what they found out. He said, we found out that when people crossed the line of faith, don't you love it when people can't use Bible words? I think he meant when they got saved. So I don't know if they like that word or a lot of other things about it. He said, when they crossed the line of faith, became followers of Jesus, watch this, you're going to be astounded. This will be worth your coming to the conference for. He said, we should have told them to Read the Bible on their own. Wow, who ever heard of that? Man, this is Willow Creek. This is the one has an association of churches. This is the guru of the contemporary church movement, George Barna, another big guru of the contemporary church. He told you people didn't like this and they didn't like that. And he took a survey and found out what unchurched Harry liked and you'd have a church for unchurched Harry. And George Barna became so disgusted with the spiritual conditions of the churches that he had helped create. He wrote two books. You read them, Revolution and Pagan Christianity. He doesn't even believe in the church anymore. He, he thinks you ought to have 30 people, no more, sitting around a circle on chairs, everybody getting to talk, and he thinks that is the church, because it was such a mess. I, I wrote him a letter. I said, Mr. Barna, uh, I wonder, since these people followed your advice, to what extent you accept responsibility for the thing that you're worried about in your book? And I said, by the way, there is a church not far from you in Lancaster. You might want to visit where lives are being changed, and where people are following the Bible, and where they are growing in grace. He never wrote me back. But some of you bozos haven't got as smart as the people who started the mess. And you got the idea you got to do some of that in order to reach people today. Yeah, now listen, I want to reach everybody I can, but it is way more important that I be right than that I be successful. The wisdom which is from above is first pure and then peaceable, easy to be entreated. And Noah didn't change his message and he didn't change his approach and he didn't say, well, this isn't working real well with this society and I'm going to have to become culturally sensitive and I guess we'll build a bunch of rowboats. Maybe that'll make more sense. Maybe we'll start a kayaking club. No, God said build an ark and he built an ark. 120 years and then notice his salvation. I love this. Noah, being warned of God of things not seen of yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Say, well, Noah didn't do very well. No converts. Maybe the, the three ladies that his sons married, you could count, and that's about it. I'll tell you what he did do. He provided an instrument of salvation for himself and for his wife and for his sons and for his daughters-in-law and his own family was saved. I hear people say, well, be careful. You don't get so busy in the work of God. If you work too hard for God, your family will go to the devil. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe in the family. I believe in family time. I believe in vacations. I believe in being close to to your children. I am for all of that. But, but can I tell you, there, there's some people out there saying some stuff just kind of stupid. Like uh, people taking vows that their children will always be in sight of one or the other of the parents. Where'd you get that? I can't serve in the nursery because I have to be around my own children. Our children can't go to Sunday school because they've got to be with us all the time. The cult of the family. 
Now, I'm, I, I'm, I believe in the family. I preach in the family. I have a wonderful family, beautiful wife, sweet, godly wife, two great daughters, good sons-in-law, wonderful grandchildren. I'm grateful for all of that. But do you know, can I tell you something? There may be a few people who in their service for God have neglected their family and lost their children, but there are way more young people that have gone to the devil because mom and dad didn't do enough for God than have ever gone to the devil because they did too much for God. There are way more young people being raised by parents who don't show the importance of the gospel by going out and knocking on doors and sharing it with people. They don't show the importance of the work of God by sacrificially giving it to it. They don't show the importance of church by being there Sunday morning. Morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night whenever the doors are open and then they wonder why their children don't want to live for God because they saw you treat it like a membership in the lodge the Elks or the Moose or some other organization like that I just have to imagine it was hard being part of Noah's family everybody thought they were crazy Nobody agreed with them. Nobody supported them. I can imagine Mrs. Noah saying, Honey, have you got to work on the ark again tonight? I was kind of hoping you might fix some things over here in the house. I can imagine the boys uh, saying, Daddy, why can't we play in the Hebrew Little League? Our friends go out and they play baseball and we got to come around and help you cut boards and carry wood and put things together and put pitch on stuff. Let me tell you something. You better be real in your Christian life if you want it to be real for your children. It better be the real deal for you if it's going to be the real deal for them. Noah saved his family by his service for the God of gods and the King of kings. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And then notice his condemnation by the which he condemned the world. He condemned the world by the testimony of his lips. The Bible says that Noah, 2 Peter 2, 5, was a preacher of righteousness. He condemned the world by the testimony of his life. Well... Things are so bad in these times. It's just such a pagan society that, you know, you can't serve God anymore. Now, you listen to me. I want you to think about this for a minute. Lamech was Noah's father. And if I do the math right, Lamech was 56. Can I make it either 54 or 56 when Adam died? Lamech knew the truth. The truth was available. Lamech didn't die till 95 years after Noah's sons had been born. The truth's always available. It's just not always listened to. And the idea that nobody knows and nobody understands. No, don't forget, everybody has a God consciousness. Everybody has a witness of creation. Jesus is the true light that lights everyone that comes into the world. And don't think that what you're saying is unheard of and unthought of and unbelievable and so strange that nobody can listen to it. No, they just don't like it. They just choose to reject it. And what Noah did, Noah said by his life, hey, if I could live for God, in this society, you could have too. If I could raise my family in this society, you could have too. If I could listen to God's message and follow it in this time, you could have too. You know why some people don't like the Lancaster Baptist Church? You know why some preachers don't like it? They don't like it. They, they try to find something wrong with it. I know what's wrong with you. You, uh, uh, you, you have, you have a, a red tie and a gray suit. That's it. Muslims wear those colors. You have theater seats, and those theater seats are only designed to encourage people to go to the movies. I'll tell you, Lancaster Baptist Church, they even put wood on the back of their platform. Ah, you know why they do that? Because they want to find some reason to excuse their own laziness and lack of initiative and do-nothing attitude. And it's way easier to say, well, you know, they're liberal and they've done this and they've done that. This is an independent, fundamental, conservative church. But the, the chapel has standards some of you'd be embarrassed to mention out loud. You'd be amazed if you knew some of the policies and some of the things he has, how careful and how conservative he is. No, they, you know why they don't like this church? Because he condemns them. 
He doesn't stand up and say you're all no goods. He just does it, and people keep getting saved, and the church keeps growing, and they keep going forward, and they keep building buildings, $64 million worth of buildings in 31 years, and they don't like it, so they try to pick at them. That's why they pick at you. That's why they pick at me, because our godly example condemns them. A young man in Athens said to Socrates, I hate you. Because every time I meet you, you show me what I am. One reason the godly are criticized by the lips of the ungodly is that the ungodly are condemned by the lives of the godly. And by the way, that's we're not meanly, not unkindly. We, we're just going to live for God and by the grace of God do the right thing and, and have the right spirit. And, and, and when your children are nice and polite and they say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, people don't like you because their children have messed up because they didn't raise them according to the Word of God. And when your church is growing because you're knocking on doors and winning people to Christ, people don't like you because you're condemning their laziness and their lack of effort. Curtis Hudson was building the Forest Hills Baptist Church and one day they had a big day and 100 people said, Saved. And later on, 200 people were saved. And finally, had one day, 500 people saved. And he said, I thought everybody would be happy for us. He was talking to Dr. B.R. Lakin. He said, they're criticizing us. They're against us. They're saying this and that. And Dr. Lakin said, oh, don't worry about it, son. As long as they're kicking you in the rear, you know you're still out in front. We should not be surprised by the attack of the world. We should not expect the applause of the world. We should be willing to accept the reproach of the Lord Jesus Christ because our godliness always makes ungodliness uncomfortable. And then Noah had a reservation. He was made an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Bob Jones Sr. said some people are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. I've never met anybody like that. I wish I had some members that my biggest problem was trying to bring them down a little bit from their spirituality. I know a whole lot of people so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. But can I tell you, we ought to be a little bit heavenly minded. We ought to realize that our conversation is not in this world and our reservation is in the next world. And this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon us from heaven's open door. We shouldn't feel all that much at home in this old world anymore. We are on the winning side. I did read the last chapter of the book and the good guys win. This earth is not all there is. It's a very brief speck in the thing we call time, which is an infinitesimal dot in what God calls eternity and we got a little time to walk across the stage and do our job and serve our master and hopefully hear the words well done thou good and faithful servant and when it's all done we'll be in heaven forever so let me make a few applications and be done God expects us to believe him just believe him you don't have to read some book just read the Bible does it say preach the gospel to every creature does it say that, that I'm supposed to go into all the world? I'm supposed to preach to all nations that I should take the gospel of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world? Does it say that? Does it say, say that I should live justly, holy in this present world? Does it say that God's word should be my meditation day and night? Does it say that I should pray without ceasing? Does it say not forsaking the assembly of themselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another? And so much the more as you see the day approaching, we'll then just do what it says. Second thought is this. By way of application, God often calls us to impossible tasks. My wife Got a little book. It was reprinted in 1990 for a big meeting Bud Calvert organized on missions. I told the stories of missionaries in just, just maybe 12, 15, 20 pages about the different missionaries. I couldn't believe it as I was reading that little book. Adam Iron Judson, if I remember correctly, lost all of his children. John G. Patton went to New Hebrides Island. His wife gave birth to a little boy. 19 days later, she died. 36 days of age, the baby died. Chased by the cannibals in all kinds of difficulties. Had to flee one time on a ship, raised money, and came back and with a steamship went to the same islands. I heard a preacher, Brother Ramos in Mexico, 
say that Charles Darwin came to the New Hebrides Islands when he made his survey trip on the Beagle. He said that when John G. Patton came to the New Hebrides Islands, there was not a single Christian. They were all cannibals. And when he left some 40 years later, there was not a single cannibal. And almost all of them were Christians. And Charles Darwin said, I do not believe in God. But if I did, it'd be because of what I've seen happen at the New Hebrides Island under the work of John G. Patton. God often calls us to impossible tasks, but he makes them possible Next thought is this, and I hope you get this, we will never please God unless we are willing to bear his reproach. Remember what it said in Hebrews? Go outside the camp. And be willing to bear his reproach. Now, there are a lot of things that bring reproach to the work of God, or not to the work of God, but from the world to us when we try to do the work of God. But I think the two things that cause the most reproach these days are soul winning and separation. They don't like it if you don't drink what they drink. We had a young man out of our church, fine young man, went to the country of Poland, worked hard, was faithful, did a good job, and He'd come back, and we'd be glad to hear his reports, but I began to hear some things that I talked to him, and, and he was one of those guys who didn't tell you straight up right away. Hey, listen, young missionaries, if you're not going to do what we do, then tell us before you ask for our money. If you change your mind, then tell us. And I finally got it down by asking enough specific questions that he felt it necessary to drink wine in order to be socially acceptable and reach people with the gospel. Now, he didn't drink hard liquor, and he really didn't like the wine, but he just had, you don't ever have to disobey the Bible. You say, well, they won't like me. Well, they didn't like Noah very much, but he's the reason we still have a human race. His faithfulness in his ministry saved his house and left a testimony and an example that lasts and impacts upon us to this day. Sure, if you don't do what they do, they think it's strange that we not don't run to the same excess of riot that they do. They think we're odd because of that. But you will never please God if you're not willing to bear the reproach of man. Next thought is this. The best legacy we can leave our children is a life of loving labor for our Lord. My dad is 89 years old. If he lives till July 21st, I have every reason to believe he will, he'll be 90. He heard the gospel for the first time at the age of 21. Heard old Bob Jones Sr. preach, and he'd never heard it before, and he said, wow, that sounds like a good deal to me. And he'd tell you today that he was saved sitting in his seat. Later on, went to the altar, and Monroe Parker met him, and he sent him off to somebody who prayed with him and formalized his decision. Dad just went on serving God and never turned back, never looked back. And almost every time I talk to him at the chapel, he's got something he's excited about. He met somebody that was influenced by his ministry earlier. He led somebody to Christ. The other day, he went to McDonald's, the favorite hangout of 89-year-olds, <laughs> at least for breakfast. And he started witnessing to a man there and led him to Christ. And the man said, how do you think I am? And dad guessed. And the man said, nope. And he pulled out his wallet, showed him his driver's license. He was 96 years old. And the best part was his license was valid for another four years. <laughs> and dad says these words often. He said, it's amazing. It's amazing. God did this and God did that. It's amazing. He goes to a small church, tries to encourage the pastor several times. Has had a big day that my dad organizes all by himself. He gets his Sunday school class excited and gets relatives and friends and people he knows in the area to come and they get a big bunch out and see some people saved. Now, now my dad has left me very little financially. And when he dies, he'll probably leave me even less. I hope I don't have too many bills to pay. But I'll tell you what my dad made me believe. He made me believe it was fun to serve God. 
He may believe it was the best thing in the world to be in the work of God. He may believe that souls were more important than what the world calls success and, and that seeing people come to Christ was more important than having a big house and having a bunch of money. And, and you say what you want to say and do what you want to do, but you'll never do anything better for your children than let them see you happily, vigorously, faithfully, fully invested in the work of Jesus Christ. The last one is this. It's often difficult to serve God. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, by the way, it's not quite as hard as some people make it out to be. Oh, it's so hard. It's such a burden. It's so terrible. Well, it is hard, and there are challenges, but did you know it's harder to serve the devil? You understand that? Right. The, you know, the devil, uh, he has a lot of faithful servants, and God has some faithful servants. And I've never seen somebody drunk in a gutter lying in their own vomit because of faithful service to God. We have a housing minister where people have addictions, and none of them ever got addicted because they were living for God. My dad ran the Detroit Rescue Mission, built the building there now, and it's now the largest mission in the world, uh, no longer fundamental, but still uh, doing some things to reach people and help people. And none of those drunks ever came in there, and they got drunks because they were obeying the Bible and living. No, no, it is not God who's a harsh taskmaster. It's the devil who's a harsh taskmaster. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's sometimes difficult to serve God. But it's always worth it. <laughs> always worth it. You know maybe the story of Will Borden, heir to a family fortune, not the Borden dairy as some people say, but a family fortune. While at Yale, felt a burden and a stirring to be a missionary, he wanted to reach Arabic-speaking peoples. He realized that the money that he had might be a hindrance to his trust and faith in God. And I'm told that Will Borden one day gave away all of his money. I read a list of some of the large sums of money he gave to various organizations. And they say that Will Borden went home and opened the flyleaf of his Bible. And after he'd given all that money away, he wrote down, No reserve. A while after that, his family called him in. They said, Will, we've been watching you. You've done well in school. You're a bright young man. We'd like you to come to work for us, and we want you to become the, the head, the chairman, of you will, of the board of the Borden Dairy Company. And not the Borden Dairy Company, the Borden, their, their family business. And Will Borden said, I appreciate that, but God's called me to be a missionary. Well, they said, we knew you might want to do that. Go ahead, get it out of your system, but anytime you want to come back, we'll hold the job for you. And Will Borden said, no, I'm not coming back. He went home and in the flyleaf of his Bible under where he'd written, no reserves, he wrote, no return. He went to Egypt, there to study the language of the place he eventually intended to serve. And while he was there, he got what they called cerebral meningitis. Before he ever landed in the field that he intended to reach for the gospel. Before he had a single convert or preached a single sermon to those people that he felt God had called them to, Will Borden died. Brought his body back. Had a funeral service at Yale. And they said that they opened the Bible. They found out there were no longer two entries, but three. And sometime after Will Borden had become ill, but before he'd passed away, he had put a third entry. And now his Bible said, no reserves, no return, and no regrets. And I'm here to tell you, nobody's ever been sorry they served Jesus Christ. Ask Noah while the rain is falling and the waters are rising and, and he and his family are safe in the ark and God has shut the door. Ask him if the 120 years was worth it. Ask him if the rejection of the world was worth it. Ask him if the mocking was worth it. Ask him if the labor was worth it. And they say that when they had the funeral service for Will Borden, almost, if I understand the story right, spontaneously, not as a result of an invitation, 
A man stood up, a young man, and he said, I, I'm going to go and take Will Borden's place. And another young man said, no, God's calling me. I'm going to go. And another and another. And I'm told there were 12 young men that stood up at that funeral and said, I will go serve as a missionary. God did not waste Will Borden's life. He invested it. Amen. So, I think we need some Noah's. Just serve because God said so. Just serve whether you see anything happen for a while or not. Just serve because it's what the Bible said. Just stand if you're the only one. Just stand. Be made an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Prepare the ark to the saving of your house. And live a life that, without being harsh, unkind, or inappropriate, condemns the world. Lord.